Palisade Global Investments is pleased to present the Hard Asset Conference on Jekyll Island with keynote addresses by Eric Sprott and Dr. Edward Griffin, author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. The event will be sponsored by Triumph Gold Corp, currently drilling its 100% owned free gold mountain project in the Yukon, and by Mexican Gold Corp, just weeks away from publishing its maiden resource on its Las Minas Gold Project in Veracruz State, Mexico. Come join us at the Jekyll Island Club from October 19th to the 22nd. The event is limited to just 50 participants. Visit palisadeconference.com for more information. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. And as you see from the introduction of Palisade Radio this week, we are throwing a conference on Jekyll Island, the significance of which is the creation spot of the Federal Reserve, which was founded in 1913. And on the line with us today, who's going to be a keynote speaker at the event, G. Edward Griffin. He's the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. G. Edward Griffin, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me back. It's a pleasure. What is the creature from Jekyll Island? Where did you get the influence for the title that you chose for your book? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we don't have a lot of time, so I, I don't have the luxury of giving you the full background on that. But I did have fun with the title because I thought that if somebody saw the book in a bookstore window, they'd think it, it was a sequel to Jurassic Park or something like that and I was hoping to catch attention with it which is important when you're an author you got to have a book with a, a snappy title or people never notice it but beyond that it has great historic significance as you know because Jekyll Island even though it sounds somewhat like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or may bring up uh, visions of the creature from the Black Lagoon all that Jekyll Island is a real island and it's off the coast of Georgia and back in 1910, when this when this history was being written, uh, being played out, it was the origin of the um, Federal Reserve System. And it was a, an island that was privately owned by a small group of billionaires from New York, the big banking interests and the big industrialists. And we're talking about J.P. Morgan and William Rockefeller and, you know, their business associates. And uh, so that's it's where the Federal Reserve was actually conceived at a highly secret meeting that was taking place there to be out of the prying eyes of the press or uh, anybody else in, in the political scene back in Washington, D.C. So it's that's the reason I called it the creature. Certainly the Federal Reserve is a creature. It's not what most people think it is. It's not a government agency, and it's not here to help us. It's really a, it's a cartel. It's, like, it's a banking cartel, very similar to a you know, like a oil cartel or a peanut cartel. It just happens to be bankers. And so the, it, that's the creature, and it did come from Jekyll Island, and so there you have it. Great. Well, the setting of the talk that you're going to be giving at the conference will actually be in what's called the Federal Reserve Room, which is a very significant room at the Jekyll Island Club. It's where much of the creature uh, was fathomed up and created. Now, since the inception of the Fed, the U.S. dollar has lost, some people would claim, up to 98% of its purchasing power. And one way to protect one's money in this situation over the years since has been uh, hedging yourself or insuring yourself with hard assets, and that's the name of our conference. What would you tell people, uh, in a nutshell, was the, uh, the, what the Federal Reserve created and why that benefits hard assets? The Federal Reserve, as I mentioned a moment ago, is a cartel of bankers. And when you think about banks, the only way that banks really make money is through interest on loans. Now, yes, they can c collect some uh, fees for services, but the real, the real windfall comes when a bank collects interest on a loan. So in order for a bank to collect a lot of interest, it has to loan a lot of money. And if the money supply, which is the inventory of a bank, it's how they, you know, it's the foundation for their profit. If the money supply is restricted, that restricts the profit that the banks can make. So banks hate any money system that is limited in supply. They love a money system that can be expanded at will. 
uh, completely at the will of the banks or the politicians, just created out of nothing, because that gives them a, a bigger inventory and they can have more money out at loan and therefore collect more interest. So the banks uh, have always had an instinctive aversion to any kind of money that was based on uh, gold or silver uh, because that limits the supply. So, so the b banks like to have um, lots of money that they can create out of nothing. And that's what the Federal Reserve System allows them to do. When the, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed into law in, in uh, 1913, it legalized basically what we might call, um, you know, a counterfeiting. It legalized the creation of money out of nothing. And that's kind of an oversimplification because it's really the creation of money out of debt, which is even worse <laughs> than nothing. Um, but anyway, so the banks started to create a huge amount of money. And uh, and not, this money was not backed by anything. That's the reason they like it. And so this results in inflation, meaning the, the supply of the money expands faster than the expansion of goods and services, which means that the purchasing power of the dollar goes down, 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 down. Until finally, as you said a moment ago, uh, today uh, a dollar buys um, what a 1913, uh, two cents would have purchased. Two cents in 1913, uh, two copper pennies buys as much, uh, did buy as much as a dollar would today. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that um, a money that's based on nothing like that is, um, is, is predatory. It steals the savings away from the people. And that cash flow moves from the people to the banks and to the politicians and to the wealthy uh, speculators that know how to play that game. So in a nutshell, the reason, the primary reason that I am opposed to the Federal Reserve is because it's, it's a system of legalized plunder. And uh, hard assets are a way, for a while at least, to escape that uh, terrible game. If you have hard assets and your wealth is stored in gold, silver, or a warehouse full of new tires or a warehouse full of cheap white wine or whatever is in that warehouse has intrinsic value, your wealth uh, can be protected a lot better than if it's just in dollars. The inevitable conclusion would be that the system can't continue as it is or that the party at some point will come to an end. And one would think that there would be several implications that would have both as a citizen of the United States or as the bank or government of the United States, which benefits potentially from the Federal Reserve System. I know you can't speak to that very broadly in the short amount of time we have, but what are some quick conclusions that you've drawn as to what might be uh, the end game of the Federal Reserve, or maybe I should say the ending of the Federal Reserve? Yeah, it's a good question. You're quite right. Uh, this cannot continue forever. In fact, it's obviously very close to the end now. When you take any any quantity or substance, any any mathematical formula, and you take a whole and you decrease its uh, size to 2% of uh, its original size, and the rate of decline is uh, accelerating, it's exponential. Uh, obviously, in the very near future, the value of that unit, meaning our purchasing power as an economy, will be zero or so close to it that it's in indistinguishable from zero. So something's got to happen, and um, traditionally what happened in history is that the system that has allowed that to exist, it's been destroyed. It's just been, just disappears um, off the face of the earth. It's uh, in, uh, competitors move in from the north or the south, or they take it over, they conquer it. It has no, no more strength. Um, there are riots and revolution and uh, starvation and disunity and chaos, like we are beginning to see develop now. And uh, out of that, there's usually a strong nation that has just been waiting for it to weaken and fall. We have a couple of them in the world that have been watching the United States commit suicide. And I think they're just drooling over being able to march in someday and, and uh, pick up all of the remnants that are left of our great wealth that we once had. Uh, we, you know, I don't have to name them. You know who they are. They're just, they hate America. From, in some cases, uh, it seems like they have some good reasons. But uh, they're waiting to move in. But the difference here is that this time around, it's not just one nation that's committing suicide. 
But the whole world is now internationalized and the monetary system has become almost welded into one. So it won't be just a case of the United States collapsing. It'll be a case of the whole bloody world collapsing. And there would be no strong neighbor to move in because they'll all be in a similar state of collapse. But what they're planning to do, in my view, is that their end game is to, just before this happens, to create a new system, something the world has never seen before. It'll be a totalitarian system. It'll be one in which money really doesn't exist in the traditional form. It'll be all electronic. It'll, it'll be digits. And we see a lot of that. Most of our money is digital today, so the transition won't take much. But uh, there'll be nothing printed. We t you hear the talk about the cashless society. That's what that's all about. Yeah, the um, ability, your ability to provide or to purchase food or shelter or clothing or medical care, education, travel, whatever it is, will be dependent upon digital units that will be assigned to you. And this is the end game. It will be assigned to you by the government based upon the degree to which you are cooperative with the state. And if you uh, disagree or you criticize or you oppose, uh, you will not survive because you won't have any economic units. You will not be able to buy food. You will not have credits for housing or medical care or anything like that because you are an enemy of the state. That's the end game we're heading toward, folks. And uh, it's as clear as it can be if you just, you know, get your head out of the TV set, stop looking at Dancing with the Stars, and look what's happening on the streets and around the world. And uh, that's where it's headed. Now, do, does it have to go all the way? No, it doesn't. But we better wake up real fast and uh, do something to turn it around. That is a very grim picture that you've painted indeed. And I can't wait to get to the conference to ask some questions and, and see how you got to that conclusion and, of course, how we can avoid reaching that end point. Before we end, I want to ask you about a topic that's been on the minds of many hard asset investors or people seeking insurance or alternative methods aside from gold, and that's the craze of cryptocurrencies, which is in uh, what, I've, what I would deem a speculative craze right now. Um, there's a lot of people who are supporting the cryptocurrencies and it seems to be gaining wider and wider uh, attention. And uh, I want to see what you think of the cryptocurrency space as an alternative to U.S. dollars. Well, uh, there are different aspects, as you just pointed out. There are di different uh, elements in this discussion. Um, the one that seems to predominate any, um, any Internet uh, discussion on this is uh, how much money you can make if you jump in now. That seems to be the whole thing. And you use the right word when you said speculation. Most of the discussion about cryptocurrencies today uh, starts off with some discussion about how wonderful it is that the quantity is limited and so forth and there's privacy. And it's true, by the way. I, I'm not uh, denigrating that. It is nice to have privacy for a change in an economic transaction. And I do like the blockchain technology because it allows people to uh, – peer-to-peer -peer do economic transactions without having to go through the bank or without having your personal information disclosed to the government. So it allows privacy and economy and all of that. And it's the reason I like it. Um, but that's not what most of the discussion is today. If you get something in your email box, it's something like this. It's, now is the last time you're going to be able to jump on the bandwagon and make 8,000% in the next three weeks or something like that. So the conversation, I think, is um, a little bit twisted. I, I wish people weren't looking at it as speculation because all, all speculations wind up as disappointment somewhere down the line. Some people can make a lot of money on the way up, but usually they, they collapse at the end and most people have lost uh, more than they gained and something like that. So I don't like to see the speculative element in this discussion. But if we just look at the at the blockchain technology, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think we're going to see more of it in the future for economic transactions. Unfortunately, the banks themselves see the handwriting on the wall, and they're spending an inordinate amount of their resources to develop blockchain technology that they can use, which will not be so private. It will be centralized and uh, so forth. And they're determined to do that. And, of course, they're big players. If they're determined to do it and they've got the, their friends in government, they're probably going to be able to do it. But um, And then the other thing I'd like to say about uh, cryptocurrency is that it is totally, totally digital. And one of the qualities that 
uh, any gold bug has known that is a, a necessary quality for good money is that the the commodity used for the money must have intrinsic value for something other than money. So e even if you don't use it for money, you can use it for something else. That's, that's how money comes into existence. In the beginning, money started off as wheat, jars of wheat, and then it became cattle, how many cattle you had, you know? You could use, you can eat the wheat, you can eat the kettle, and just go to any prison, uh, and you'll know that cigarettes are used as money. People smoke the cigarettes. And so anything with some kind of value is one of the traditional requirements for a lasting money supply. Well, digital money or crypto money doesn't have any of that. It's completely, completely digital. And uh, so if the Internet goes down and stays down for a long period of time, there's the end of your monetary transaction. It will not work. So I, I don't think uh, we've come anywhere close to a point in history where we can say, well, we don't need gold or silver anymore. We got something better. No, we're not there yet. Well, take this as merely a taste of many of the discussions that we're going to be having between October 19th and the 22nd at the Jekyll Island Club on Jekyll Island. If you're interested in coming, please visit palisadeconference.com and apply there to be a part of our very small group. There's going to be just 50 particip participants in all. And uh, Mr. Griffin, as well as Eric Sprott, will be there for the entirety of the weekend, both giving uh, a talk and talking with the participants of the event. It's going to be a fun time. Mr. Griffin, thank you very much for coming back on the program and, of course, looking forward to seeing you on Jekyll Island in October. Yes, uh, we'll be in that famous room where the Federal Reserve was actually conceived. It's a, it's a very nice room, and by the way, you can look up on the, on, the, on the mantle above the fireplace, and there are all the photographs of the people that sat around the same table that we'll probably be sitting around, or one like it. They're the people that created the Federal Reserve System. will be very exciting. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. See you there. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?